The Charnel God by Clark Ashton Smith Mordigian is the god of Zul Basair, said the innkeeper with unctuous solemnity. He has been the god from years that are lost to man's memory and shadowed deeper than the subterranes of his black temple. There is no other god in Zul Basair, and all who die within the walls of the city are sacred to Mordigian. Even the kings and the optimates, at death, are delivered into the hands of his muffled priests. It is the law and the custom. A little while, and the priests will come for your bride. But Aleph is not dead, protested the youth Farium, for the third or fourth time, in piteous desperation. Her malady is one that assumes the lying likeness of death. Twice before she has lain insensible, with a pallor upon her cheeks, and a stillness in her very blood, that could hardly be distinguished from those of the tomb, and twice she has awakened after an interim of days. The innkeeper peered with an air of ponderous unbelief at the girl who lay white and motionless as a moan lily on the bed in the poorly furnished attic chamber. In that case, you should not have brought her into Zul Basayir, he averred in a tone of owlish irony. The physician has pronounced her dead, and her death has been reported to the priests. She must go to the temple of Mordigian. But we are outlanders, guests of a night. We have come from the land of Zylak, far in the north, and this morning we should have gone on through to Tassun, toward Farad, the capital of Yoros, which lies near to the southern sea. Surely your god could have no claim upon Elaith, even if she were truly dead. All who die in Zul Basayir are the property of Mordigian, insisted the taverner sententiously. Outlanders are not exempt. The dark maw of his temple yawns eternally, and no man, no child, no woman, throughout the years, has evaded its yawning. All mortal flesh must become, in due time, the provender of the god. Ferium shuddered at the oily and portentous declaration. Dimly have I heard of Mordigian, as a legend that travelers tell in Zylac, he admitted. But I had forgotten the name of his city, and Elaith and I came ignorantly into Zul Basair. Even had I known, I should have doubted the terrible custom of which you inform me. What manner of deity is this, who imitates the hyena and the vulture? Surely he is no god, but a ghoul. Take heed, lest you utter blasphemy, admonished the innkeeper. Mordigian is old and omnipotent as death. He was worshipped in former continents, before the lifting of Zothik from out of the sea. Through him we are saved from corruption and the worm. Even as the people of other places devote their dead to the consuming flame, so we of Zul Basair deliver ours to the god. Awful is the fane, a place of terror and obscure shadow, untrod by the sun, into which the dead are borne by his priests, and are laid on a vast table of stone, to await his coming from the nether vault in which he dwells. No living men, other than the priests, have ever beheld him, and the faces of the priests are hidden behind masks of silver, and even their hands are shrouded, that men may not gaze on them that have seen Mordigian. But there is a king in Zul Basair, is there not? I shall appeal to him against this heinous and horrible injustice. Surely he will heed me. Thancor is the king, but he could not help you, even if he wished. Your appeal will not even be heard. Mordigian is above all kings, and his law is sacred. Hark, for already the priests come. Ferium, sick at heart with the charnel terror and cruelty of the doom that impended for his girlish wife in this unknown city of nightmare, heard an evil, stealthy creaking on the stairs that led to the attic of the inn. The sound drew nearer with inhuman rapidity, and four strange figures came into the room, heavily garbed in funereal purple, and wearing huge masks of silver graven in the likeness of skulls. It was impossible to surmise their actual appearance, for, even as the taverner had hinted, their very hands were concealed by fingerless gloves. 
and the purple gowns came down in loose folds that trailed about their feet like unwinding cerecloths. There was a horror about them, of which the macabre masks were only a lesser element, a horror that lay partly in their unnatural crouching attitudes, and the beast-like agility with which they moved, unhampered by their cumbrous habiliments. Among them they carried a curious beer, made from interwoven strips of leather, and with monstrous bones that served for frame and handles. The leather was greasy and blackened, as if from long years of mortuary use. Without speaking to Ferium or the innkeeper, and with no delay or formality of any sort, they advanced toward the bed on which the lathe was lying. Undeterred by their more than formidable aspect, and wholly distraught with grief and anger, Ferium drew from his girdle a short knife, the only weapon he possessed. Disregarding the minatory cry of the taverner, he rushed wildly upon the muffled figures. He was quick and muscular, and moreover was clad in light, close-fitting raiment, such as would seemingly have given him a brief advantage. The priests had turned their backs upon him, but, as if they had foreseen his every action, two of them wheeled about with the swiftness of tigers, dropping the handles of bone that they carried. One of them struck the knife from Ferium's hand with a movement that the eye could barely follow in its snaky darting. Then both assailed him, beating him back with terrible flailing blows of their shrouded arms, and hurling him half across the room into an empty corner. Stunned by his fall, he lay senseless for a term of minutes. Recovering dazedly, with eyes that blurred as he opened them, he beheld the fact of the stout taverner stooping above him like a tallow-colored moon. The thought of a lathe, more sharp than the thrust of a dagger, brought him back to agonizing consciousness. Fearfully, he scanned the shadowy room and saw that the ceramented priests were gone, that the bed was vacant. He heard the orotund and sepulchral croaking of the taverner. The priests of Mordigian are merciful. They make allowance for the frenzy and distraction of the newly bereaved. It is well for you that they are compassionate and considerate of mortal weakness. Ferium sprang erect as if his bruised and aching body were scorched by a sudden fire. Pausing only to retrieve his knife, which still lay in the middle of the room, he started toward the door. He was stopped by the hand of the hosteler, clutching greasily at his shoulder. Beware, lest you exceed the bounds of the mercy of Mordigian. It is an ill thing to follow his priests, and a worse thing to intrude upon the deathly and sacred gloom of his temple. Ferium scarcely heard the admonition. He wrenched himself hastily away from the odious fingers and turned to go. But again the hand clutched him. At least pay me the money that you owe for food and lodging ere you depart, demanded the innkeeper. Also, there is the matter of the physician's fee, which I can settle for you if you will entrust me with the proper sum. Pay now, for there is no surety that he will return. Ferium drew out the purse that contained his entire worldly wealth, and filled the greedily cupped palm before him with coins that he did not pause to count. With no parting word or backward glance, he descended the moldy and musty stairs of the worm-eaten hostelry, as if spurred by an incubus, and went out into the gloomy, serpentine streets of Zul Basayir. Perhaps the city differed little from others, except in being older and darker. But to Ferium, in his extremity of anguish, the ways that he followed were like subterranean corridors that led only to some profound and monstrous charnel. The sun had risen above the overjutting houses, but it seemed to him that there was no light, other than a lost and doleful glimmering, such as might descend into mortuary depths. The people, it may have been, were much like other people, but he saw them under a malefic aspect, as if they were ghouls and demons that went to and fro on the ghastly errands of a necropolis. Bitterly, in his distraction, he recalled the previous evening, when he had entered Zulbasair at twilight with a lathe, the girl riding on the one dromedary that had survived their passage of the northern desert, and he walking beside her, wary but content. 
with the rosy purple of afterglow upon its walls and cupolas, with the deepening golden eyes of its lit windows, the place had seemed a fair and nameless city of dreams, and they planned to rest there for a day or two before resuming the long, arduous journey to Farad in Yoros. This journey had been undertaken only through necessity. Farium, an impoverished youth of noble blood, had been exiled because of the political and religious tenets of his family, which were not in accord of those of the reigning emperor, Kalepos. Taking his newly wedded wife, Farium had set out for Yoros, where certain allied branches of the house to which he belonged had already established themselves, and would give him a fraternal welcome. They had traveled with a large caravan of merchants, going directly southward to Tassoon, beyond the borders of Zylak, amid the red sands of the Kaloshian Waste, the caravan had been attacked by robbers, who had slain many of its members and dispersed the rest. Farium and his bride, escaping with their dromedaries, had found themselves lost and alone in the desert, and failing to regain the road toward Tassoon, they had taken inadvertently another track, leading to Zul Basair, a walled metropolis on the southwestern verge of the waste which their itinerary had not included. Entering Zul Basair, the couple had repaired for reasons of economy to a tavern in the humbler quarter. There, during the night, a lath had been overcome by the third seizure of the cataleptic malady to which she was liable. The earlier seizures, occurring before her marriage to Farium, had been recognized in their true character by the physicians of Zylak and had been palliated by skillful treatment. It was hoped that the malady would not recur. The third attack, no doubt, had been induced by the fatigues and hardships of the journey. Farium had felt sure that Alaith would recover, but a doctor of Zul Basair, hastily summoned by the innkeeper, had insisted that she was actually dead, and, in obedience to the strange law of the city, had reported her death without delay to the priests of Mordigian. The frantic protests of the husband had been utterly ignored. There was, it seemed, a diabolic fatality about the whole train of circumstances through which Alaith, still living, though with that outward aspect of the tomb which her illness involved, had fallen into the grasp of the devotees of the charnel god. Farium pondered this fatality almost to madness, as he strode with furious, aimless haste along the eternally winding and crowded streets. To the cheerless information received from the taverner, he added, as he went on, more and more of the tardily remembered legends which he had heard in Zylak. Ill and dubious indeed was the renown of Zul Basair, and he marveled that he should have forgotten it and cursed himself with black curses for the temporary but fatal forgetfulness. Better would it have been if he and Alaith had perished in the desert, rather than enter the wide gates that stood always open, gaping for their prey, as was the custom of Zul Basair. The city was a mart of trade, where outland travelers came, but did not care to linger, because of the repulsive cult of Mordigian the invisible eater of the dead, who was believed to share his provender with the shrouded priests. It was said that the bodies lay for days in the dark temple and were not devoured till corruption had begun, and people whispered of fouler things than necrophagism, of blasphemous rites that were solemnized in the ghoul-ridden vaults, and nameless uses to which the dead were put before Mordigian claimed them. In all outlying places, the fate of those who died in Zul Basair was a dreadful byword and a malediction. But to the people of that city, reared in the faith of the ghoulish god, it was merely the usual and expected mode of mortuary disposal. Tombs, graves, catacombs, funeral pyres, and other such nuisances were rendered needless by this highly utilitarian deity. Farium was surprised to see the people of the city going about the common businesses of life. Porters were passing with bales of household goods upon their shoulders. Merchants were squatting in their shops like other merchants. Buyers and sellers chaffered loudly in the public bazaars. 
Women laughed and chattered in the doorways. Only by their voluminous robes of red, black, and violet, and their strange uncouth accents, was he able to distinguish the men of Zulbasair from those who were outlanders like himself. The murk of nightmare began to lift from his impressions, and gradually, as he went on, the spectacle of everyday humanity all about him helped to calm a little his wild distraction and desperation. Nothing could dissipate the horror of his loss and the abominable fate that threatened Olaith. But now, with a cool logic born of a cruel exigence, he began to consider the apparently hopeless problem of rescuing her from the ghoul god's temple. He composed his features and constrained his febrile pacing to an idle saunter, so that none might guess the preoccupations that racked him inwardly. Pretending to be interested in wares of a seller of men's apparel, he drew the dealer into converse regarding Zulbasair and its customs, and made such inquiries as a traveller from far lands might make. The dealer was talkative, and Farium soon learned from him the location of the temple of Mordigian, which stood at the city's core. He also learned that the temple was open at all hours, and that people were free to come and go within its precincts. There were, however, no rituals of worship, other than certain private rites that were celebrated by the priesthood. Few cared to enter the fane, because of a superstition that any living person who intruded upon its gloom would return to it shortly as the provender of the god. Mordigian, it seemed, was a benign deity in the eyes of the inhabitants of Zulbasair. Curiously enough, no definite personal attributes were ascribed to him. He was, so to speak, an impersonal force akin to the elements, a consuming and cleansing power like fire. His hierophants were equally mysterious. They lived in the temple and emerged from it only in the execution of their funeral duties. No one knew the manner of their recruiting, but many believed that they were both male and female, thus their renewing numbers from generation to generation with no ulterior commerce. Others thought that they were not human beings at all, but an order of subterranean earth entities, who lived forever, and who fed upon corpses like the god himself. Through this latter belief, of late years, a minor heresy had arisen, some holding that Mordigian was a mere hieratic figment, and the priests were the sole devourers of the dead. The dealer, quoting this heresy, made haste to disavow it with pious reprobation. Farium chatted for a while on other topics, and then continued his progress through the city, going as forthrightly toward the temple as the obliquely running thoroughfares would permit. He had formed no conscious plan, but desired to reconnoiter the vicinage, in that which the garment dealer had told them, the one reassuring detail was the openness of the fane and its accessibility to all who dared enter. The rarity of visitors, however, would make Farium conspicuous, and he wished, above all, to avoid attention. On the other hand, any effort to remove bodies from the temple was seemingly unheard of, a thing audacious beyond the dreams of the people of Zulbasair. Through the very boldness of his design, he might avoid suspicion and succeed in rescuing the lathe. The streets that he followed began to tend downward, and were narrower, dimmer, and more tortuous than any he had yet traversed. He thought for a while that he had lost his way, and he was about to ask the passers to redirect him, when four of the priests of Mordigian, bearing one of the curious litter-like beers of bone and leather, emerged from an ancient alley just before him. The bier was occupied by the body of a girl, and for one moment of convulsive shock and agitation that left him trembling, Farium thought that the girl was a lathe. Looking again, he saw his mistake. The gown that the girl wore, though simple, was made of some rare, exotic stuff. Her features, though pale as those of a lathe, were crowned with curls like the petals of heavy black poppies. Her beauty, warm and voluptuous, even in death, differed from the blonde pureness of a lathe as tropic lilies differ from narcissi. Quietly and maintaining a discreet interval, Farium followed the sullenly shrouded figures and their lovely burden. 
he saw that people made way for the passage of the beer with odd, unquestioning alacrity, and the loud voices of hucksters and chafferers were hushed as the priests went by. Overhearing a murmured conversation between two of the townsfolk, he learned that the dead girl was Arctella, daughter of Quanos, a high noble and magistrate of Zulba Sair. She had died very quickly and mysteriously, from a cause unknown to the physicians, which had not marred or wasted her beauty in the least. There were those who held that an indetectable poison, rather than disease, had been the agency of death, and others deemed her the victim of malefic sorcery. The priests went on, and Ferium kept them in sight as well as he could in the blind tangle of streets. The way steepened without affording any clear prospect of the levels below, and the houses seemed to crowd more closely, as if huddling back from a precipice. Finally, the youth emerged from behind his macabre guides in a sort of circular hollow at the city's heart, where the temple of Mordigian loomed alone and separate amid pavements of sad onyx, and funerary cedars whose green had blackened, as if with the underparting charnel shadows bequeathed by dead ages. The edifice was built of a strange stone, hued as with the blackish purple of carnal decay, a stone that refused the ardent luster of noon, and the prodigality of dawn or sunset glory. It was low and windowless, having the form of a monstrous mausoleum, its portals yawned sepulchrally in the gloom of the cedars. Ferium watched the priests as they vanished within the portals, carrying the girl Arctella like phantoms who bear a phantom burden. The broad area of pavement between the recoiling houses and the temple was now deserted, but he did not venture to cross it in the blare of betraying daylight. Circling the area, he saw that there were several other entrances to the great fane, all open and unguarded. There was no sign of activity about the place, but he shuddered at the thought of that which was hidden within its walls, even as the feasting of worms is hidden in the marble tomb. Like a vomiting of charnels, the abominations of which he had heard rose up before him in the sunlight, and again he drew close to madness, knowing that a lathe must lie among the dead in the temple with the foul umbrage of such things upon her, and that he, consumed with unremitting frenzy, must wait for the favorable shrouding of darkness before he could execute his nebulous, doubtful plan of rescue. In the meanwhile, she might awake and perish from the mortal horror of her surroundings, or worse even than this might befall her if the whispered tales were true. Abnon Thaw, sorcerer and necromancer, was felicitating himself on the bargain he had made with the priests of Mordigian. He felt, perhaps justly, that no one less clever than he could have conceived and executed the various procedures that had made possible this bargain, through which Arctella, daughter of the proud Quanos, would become his unquestioning slave. No other lover, he told himself, could have been resourceful enough to obtain a desired woman in this fashion. Arctella, betrothed to Allos, a young noble of the city, was seemingly beyond the aspiration of a sorcerer. Abnon Tha, however, was no common hedge wizard, but an adept of long standing in the most awful and profound arcana of the black arts. He knew the spells that kill more quickly and surely than knife or poison at a distance, and he knew also the darker spells, by which the dead can be reanimated, even after years or ages of decay. He had slain Arctella in a manner that none could detect, with a rare and a subtle involtuation that had left no mark, and her body now lay among the dead in Mordigian's temple. Tonight, with the tacit connivance of the terrible shrouded priests, he would bring her back to life. Abnon Tha was not native to Zulba Sair, but had come many years before from the infamous half-mythic isle of Sotar, lying somewhere to the east of the huge continent of Zothik. Like a sleek young vulture, he had established himself in the very shadow of the charnel fane, 
and had prospered, taking to himself pupils and assistants. His dealings with the priests were long and extensive, and the bargain he had just made was far from being the first of its kind. They had allowed him the temporary use of bodies claimed by Mordigian, stipulating only that these bodies should not be removed from the temple during the course of any of his experiments in necromancy. Since the privilege was slightly irregular from their viewpoint, he found it necessary to bribe them, not, however, with gold, but with the promise of a liberal purveyance of matters more sinister and corruptible than gold. The arrangement had been satisfactory enough to all concerned. Cadavers had poured into the temple with more than their usual abundance ever since the coming of the sorcerer. The god had not lacked for provender, and Abnon Thaw had never lacked for subjects on which to employ his more baleful spells. On the whole, Abnon Thaw was not ill-pleased with himself. He reflected, moreover, that, aside from his mastery of magic and his slightful ingenuity, he was about to manifest a well-nigh unexampled courage. He had planned a robbery that would amount to dire sacrilege, the removal of the reanimated body of Arctella from the temple. Such robberies, either of animate or exanimate corpses, and the penalty attached to them were a matter of legend only, for none had occurred in recent ages. Thrice terrible, according to common belief, was the doom of those who had tried and failed. The necromancer was not blind to the risks of his enterprise, nor, on the other hand, was he deterred or intimidated by them. His two assistants, Nargai and Vemba Sith, apprised of his intention, had made with all due privity the necessary preparations for their flight from Zulbasair. The strong passion that the sorcerer had conceived for Arctella was not his only motive, perhaps, in removing from that city. He was desirous of change, for he had grown a little wary of the odd laws that really served to restrict his necromantic practices, while facilitating them in a sense. He planned to travel southward to establish himself in one of the cities of Tassoon, an empire famous for the number and antiquity of its mummies. It was now sunset time. Five dromedaries, bred for racing, waited in the inner courtyard of Abnan Tha's house, a high and moldering mansion that seemed to lean forward upon the open, circular area belonging to the temple. One of the dromedaries would carry a bale containing the sorcerer's most valuable books, manuscripts, and other impedimenta of magic. Its fellows would bear Abnan Tha, the two assistants, and Arctella. Nargai and Vemba Tsith appeared before their master to tell them that all was made ready. Both were much younger than Abnon Tha, but, like himself, they were outlanders in Zulbasair. They came of the swart and narrow-eyed people of Nat, an isle that was little less infamous than Sotar. It is well, said the necromancer, as they stood before him with lowered eyes, after making their announcement. We have only to wait the favorable hour, midway between sunset and moonrise, when the priests are at their supper in the nether aditum. We will enter the temple and perform that which must be done for the rising of Arctella. They feed well tonight, for I know that many of the dead grow ripe on the giant table of the upper sanctuary, and it may be that Mordigian feeds also. None will come to watch us at our doing. But master, said Nargai, shivering a little beneath his robe of Nakarat red, is it wise, after all, to do this thing? Must you take the girl from the temple? Always, ere this, you have contented yourself with the brief loan that the priests allow, and have rendered back the dead in the required state of exanimation. Truly, is it well to violate the law of the god? Men say that the wrath of Mordigian, though seldom loosed, is more dreadful than the wrath of all other deities. For this reason, none has dared to defraud him in latter years, or attempt the removal of any corpses from his fane. Long ago, it is told, a high noble of the city bore hence the cadaver of a woman he had loved, and fled with it into the desert. But the priest pursued him, 
running more swiftly than jackals, and the fate that overtook him is a thing whereof the legends whisper but dimly. By fear, neither Mordigian nor his creatures, said Abnon Thaw, with a solemn vainglory in his voice. My dromedaries can outrun the priests, even granting that the priests are not men at all, but ghouls, as some say, and there is small likelihood that they will follow us. After their feasting tonight, they will sleep like gorged vultures. The morrow will find us far on the road to Tsasun, ere they awake. The master is right, interpolated Vemba Seath. We have nothing to fear. But they say that Mordigian does not sleep, insisted Nargai, and that he watches all things eternally from his black vault beneath the temple. So I have heard, said Abnon Thaw, with a dry and learned air. But I consider that such beliefs are mere superstition. There is nothing to confirm them in the real nature of corpse-eating entities. So far I have never beheld Mordigian, either sleeping or awake. But in all likelihood he is merely a common ghoul. I know these demons and their habits. They differ from hyenas only through their monstrous shape and size, and their immortality. Still, I must deem it an ill thing to cheat Mordigian, muttered Nargai beneath his breath. The words were caught by the quick ears of Abnon Thaw. Nay, there is no question of cheating. Well have I served Mordigian and his priesthood, and amply have I larded their black table. Also, I shall keep, in a sense, the bargain I have made concerning Arctella, the providing of a new cadaver in return for my necromantic privilege. Tomorrow, the youth Alos, the betrothed of Arctella, will lie in her place among the dead. Go now and leave me, for I must devise the inward involtuation that will rot the heart of Alos, like a worm that awakens at the core of fruit. Tepharium, fevered and distraught, it seemed that the cloudless day went by with the sluggishness of a corpse-clogged river. Unable to calm his agitation, he wandered aimlessly through the thronged bazaars, till the western towers grew dark on a heaven of saffron flame, and the twilight rose like a grey and curdling sea among the houses. Then he returned to the inn where Elaith had been stricken, and claimed the dromedary which he had left in the tavern stables. Riding the animal through dim thoroughfares, lit only by the covert gleam of lamps or tapers from half-closed windows, he found his way once more to the city center. The dusk had thickened into darkness when he came to the open area surrounding Mordigian's temple. The windows of mansions fronting the area were shut and lightless as dead eyes, and the fane itself, a colossal bulk of gloom, was rayless as any mausoleum beneath the gathering stars. No one, it seemed was abroad, and though the quietude was favorable to his project, Varium shivered with a chill of deathly menace and desolation. The hoofs of his camel rang on the pavement with a startling and preternatural clangor, and he thought that the ears of hidden ghouls listening alertly behind the silence must surely hear them. However, there was no stirring of life in that sepulchral gloom. Reaching the shelter of one of the thick groups of ancient cedars, he dismounted and tied the dromedary to a low-growing branch. Keeping among the trees, like a shadow among shadows, he approached the temple with infinite wariness, and circled it slowly, finding that the four doorways, which corresponded to the four quarters of the earth, were all wide open, deserted, and equally dark. Returning at length to the eastern side, on which he had tethered his camel, he emboldened himself to enter the blackly gaping portal. Crossing the threshold, he was engulfed instantly by a dead and clammy darkness, touched with the faint fetter of corruption, and a smell as of charred bone and flesh. He thought that he was in a huge corridor, and feeling his way forward along the right-hand wall, he soon came to a sudden turn and saw a bluish glimmering far ahead, as if in some central adytum, where the hall ended. Massy columns were silhouetted against the glimmering, and across it, as he drew nearer, 
several dark and muffled figures passed, presenting the profiles of enormous skulls. Two of them were sharing the burden of a human body which they carried in their arms. To Ferium, pausing in the shadowy hall, it appeared that the vague taint of putrescence upon the air grew stronger for a few instants after the figures had come and gone. They were not succeeded by any others, and the fane resumed its mausoleum stillness. But the youth waited for many minutes, doubtful and trepidant, before venturing to go on. An oppression of mortuary mystery thickened the air, and stifled him like the noisome effluvia of catacombs. His ears became intolerably acute, and he heard a dim humming, a sound of deep and viscid voices indistinguishably blent that appeared to issue from crypts beneath the temple. Stealing at length to the hall's end, he peered beyond into what was obviously the main sanctuary, a low and many-pillared room whose vastness was but half revealed by the bluish fires that glowed and flickered in numerous urn-like vessels borne aloft on slender stelae. Ferium hesitated upon that awful threshold, for the mingled odors of burnt and decaying flesh were heavier on the air, as if he had drawn nearer to their sources, and the thick humming that seemed to ascend from the dark stairway in the floor beside the left-hand wall. But the room, to all appearance, was empty of life, and nothing stirred except the wavering lights and the shadows. The watcher discerned the outlines of a vast table in the center, carved from the same black stone as the building itself. Upon the table, half-lit by the flaming urns, or shrouded by the umbrage of the heavy columns, a number of people lay side by side, and Ferium knew that he had found the black altar of Mordigian, whereon were disposed the bodies claimed by the god. A wild and stifling fear contended with the wilder hope in his bosom, trembling he went toward the table, and a cold clamminess, wrought by the presence of the dead, assailed him. The table was nearly thirty feet in length, and it rose waist-high on a dozen mighty legs. Beginning at the nearer end, he passed along the row of corpses, peering fearfully into each upturned face. Both sexes and many ages and differing ranks were represented. Nobles and rich merchants were crowded by beggars in filthy rags. Some were newly dead, and others, it seemed, had lain there for days, and were beginning to show the marks of corruption. There were many gaps in the ordered row, suggesting that certain of the corpses had been removed. Ferium went on in the dim light, searching for the loved features of a lathe. At last, when he was nearing the further end, and had begun to fear that she was not among them, he found her. With the cryptic pallor and stillness of her strange malady upon her, she lay unchanged on the chill stone. A great thankfulness was born in the heart of Ferium, for he felt sure that she was not dead, and that she had not awakened at any time to the horrors of the temple. If he could bear her away from the hateful purlieus of Zulbasair without detection, she would recover from her death-simulating sickness. Cursorily, he noted that another woman was lying beside a leaf, and recognized her as the beautiful Arctella, whose bearers he had followed almost to the portals of the fane. He gave her no second glance, but stooped to lift a lathe in his arms. At that moment, he heard a murmur of low voices in the direction of the door by which he had entered the sanctuary. Thinking that some of the priests had returned, he dropped swiftly on hands and knees and crawled beneath the ponderous table, which afforded the only accessible hiding place. Retreating into shadow beyond the glimmering shed from the lofty urns, he waited and looked out between the pillar-thick legs. The voices grew louder, and he saw the curiously sandaled feet and shortest robes of three persons who approached the table of the dead and paused in the very spot where he himself had stood a few instants before. Who they were, he could not surmise, but their garments of light and swarthy red were not the shroudings of Mordigian's priests. He was uncertain whether or not they had seen him, and crouching in the low space beneath the table, he plucked his dagger from its sheath. 
Now he was able to distinguish three voices, one solemn and unctuously imperative, one somewhat guttural and growling, and the other shrill and nasal. The accents were alien, differing from those of the men of Zulbasair, and the words were often strange to Ferium. Also, much of the converse was inaudible. Here, at the end, said the solemn voice, be swift, we have no time to loiter. Yes, master, came the growling voice, but who is this other? Truly, she is very fair. A discussion seemed to take place in discreetly lowered tones. Apparently, the owner of the guttural voice was urging something that the other two opposed. The listener could distinguish only a word or two here or there, but he gathered that the name of the first person was Vemba Tsif, and the name of the one who spoke in the nasal shrilling was called Nargai. At last, above the others, the grave accents of the man, addressed only as the master, were clearly audible. I do not altogether approve. It will delay our departure and the two must ride on one dromedary. But take her, Vembatsith, if you can perform the necessary spell unaided. I have no time for a double incantation. It will be a good test of your proficiency. There was a mumbling as of thanks or acknowledgement from Vembatsith. Then the voice of the master. Be quiet now and make haste. To Ferium, wondering vaguely and uneasily as to the import of this colloquy, it seemed that two of the three men pressed closer to the table, as if stooping above the dead. He heard a rustling of cloth upon stone, and an instant later he saw that all three were departing among the columns and stelae, in a direction opposite to that from which they had entered the sanctuary. Two of them carried burdens that glimmered palely and indistinctly in the shadows. A black horror clutched at the heart of Ferium, for all too clearly he surmised the nature of those burdens, and the possible identity of one of them. Quickly he crawled forth from his hiding place, and saw that a lathe was gone from the black table, together with the girl Arctella. He saw the vanishing of shadowy figures in the gloom that zoned the chamber's western wall. Whether the abductors were ghouls or worse than ghouls, he could not know, but he followed swiftly, forgetful of all caution in his concern for a lathe. Reaching the wall, he found the mouth of a corridor and plunged into it headlong. Somewhere in the gloom ahead, he saw a ruddy glimmering of light. Then he heard a sullen, metallic grating, and the glimmer narrowed to a slit-like gleam, as if the door of the chamber from which it issued was being closed. Following the blind wall, he came to that slit of crimson light. A door of darkly tarnished bronze had been left ajar, and Ferium peered in on a weird, unholy scene, illumined by the blood-like flames that flared and soared unsteadily from high urns upborne on sable pedestals. The room was full of a sensuous luxury that accorded strangely with the dull funereal stone of that temple of death. There were couches and carpets of superbly figured stuffs, vermilion, gold, azure, silver, and a jeweled censers of unknown metals stood in the corners. A low table at one side was littered with curious bottles and occult appliances such as might be used in medicine or sorcery. A lathe was lying on one of the couches, and near her, on a second couch, the body of the girl Arctella had been disposed. The abductors, whose faces Varium now beheld for the first time, were busying themselves with singular preparations that mystified him prodigiously. His impulse to invade the room was repressed by a sort of wonder that held him enthralled and motionless. One of the three, a tall, middle-aged man, whom he identified as the master, had assembled certain peculiar vessels, including a small brazier and a censer, and had set them on the floor beside Arctella. The second, a younger man with lecherously slitted eyes had placed similar impedimenta before Ilaith. The third, who was also young and evil of aspect, merely stood and looked on with an apprehensive, uneasy air. Ferium divined that the men were sorcerers when, with a deafness born of long practice, they lit the censers and braziers, and began simultaneously 
the intonation of rhythmically measured words in a strange tongue accompanied by the sprinkling at regular intervals of black oils that fell with a great hissing on the coals in the braziers and sent up enormous clouds of pearly smoke. Dark threads of vapor serpentined from the censers, interweaving themselves like veins through the dim, misshapen figures, as of ghostly giants that were formed by the lighter fumes. A reek of intolerably acrid balsams filled the chamber, assailing and troubling the senses of Ferium, till the scene wavered before him and took on a dreamlike vastness, a narcotic distortion. The voices of the necromancers mounted and fell, as if in some unholy paean. Imperious, exigent, they seemed to implore the consummation of forbidden blasphemy. Like thronging phantoms, writhing and swirling with malignant life, the vapors rose about the couches on which lay the dead girl and the girl who bore the outward likeness of death. Then, as the fumes were riven apart in their baleful seething, Miriam saw that the pale figure of a lathe had stirred like a sleeper who awakens, that she had opened her eyes and was lifting a feeble hand from the gorgeous couch. The younger necromancer ceased his chanting on a sharply broken cadence, but the solemn tones of the other still went on, and still there was a spell on the limbs and senses of Farium, making it impossible for him to stir. Slowly, the vapors thinned like a rout of dissolving phantoms. The watcher saw that the dead girl, Arctella, was rising to her feet like a somnambulist. The chanting of Abnantha, standing before her, came sonorously to an end. In the awful silence that followed, Ferium heard a weak cry from a lathe, and then the jubilant, growling voice of Bemba Sith, who was stooping above her. Behold, O Abnantha, my spells are swifter than yours. For she that I have chosen awakened before Arctella. Ferium was released from his thraldom, as if through the lifting of an evil enchantment. He flung back the ponderous door of darkened bronze that ground with protesting clangors on its hinges. His dagger drawn, he rushed into the room. Elaith, her eyes wide with piteous bewilderment, turned toward him and made an ineffectual effort to arise from the couch. Arctella, mute and submissive before Abnan Tha, appeared to heed nothing but the will of the necromancer. She was like a fair and soulless automaton. The sorcerers, turning as Ferium entered, sprang back with instant agility before his onset, and drew the short, cruelly crooked swords which they all carried. Nargai struck the knife from Ferium's fingers with a darting blow that shattered its thin blade at the hilt, and Vemba Tsith, his weapon swinging back in a vicious arc, would have killed the youth promptly if Abnon Tha had not intervened and bade him stay. Ferium, standing furious but irresolute before the lifted swords, was aware of the darkly searching eyes of Abnon Tha, like those of some nyctalopic bird of prey. I would know the meaning of this intrusion, said the necromancer. Truly, you are bold to enter the temple of Mordigian. I came to find the girl who lies yonder, declared Ferium. She is a laith, my wife, who was claimed unjustly by the god. But tell me, why have you brought her to this room from the table of Mordigian? And what manner of men are you that raise up the dead as you have raised this other woman? I am Abnon Tha, the necromancer, and these others are my pupils, Nargai and Vembatzith. Give thanks to Vembatzith, for verily, he has brought back your wife from the purlieus of the dead, with a skill excelling that of his master. She awoke ere the incantation was finished. Ferium glared with implacable suspicion at Abnon Tha. Elaith was not dead, but only as one in a trance, he averred. It was not your pupil's sorcery that awakened her, and verily, whether Elaith be dead or living is not a matter that should concern any but myself. Permit us to depart, for I wish to remove with her from Zulbasair, in which we are only passing travelers. So speaking, he turned his back on the necromancers, and went over to a lath, who regarded him with dazed eyes, but uttered his name feebly, as he clasped her in his arms. 
Now this is a remarkable coincidence, purred Abnon Tha. I and my pupils are also planning to depart from Zulbasair, and we start this very night. Perhaps you will honor us with your company. I thank you, said Farium curtly, but I am not sure that our roads lie together. Alaith and I would go toward Tassoon. Now, by the black altar of Mordigian, that is still stranger coincidence, for Tassoon is also our destination. We take with us the resurrected girl Arctella, whom I have deemed too fair for the charnel god and his ghouls. Farium divined the dark evil that lay behind the oily, mocking speeches of the necromancer. Also, he saw the furtive and sinister sign that Abnon Tha had made to his assistants. Weaponless, he could only give a formal assent to the sardonic proposal. He knew well that he would not be permitted to leave the temple alive, for the narrow eyes of Nargai and Vemba Tzith, regarding him closely, were alight with the red lust of murder. Come, said Abnon Tha, in a voice of imperious command. It is time to go. He turned to the still figure of Arctella and spoke an unknown word. With vacant eyes and noctambulistic paces, she followed at his heels as he stepped toward the open door. Varium had helped Alaith to her feet, and was whispering words of reassurance in an effort to lull the growing horror and confused alarm that he saw in her eyes. She was able to walk, albeit slowly and uncertainly. Vemba Tsith and Nargai drew back, motioning that she and Varium should precede them. But Farium, sensing their intent to slay him as soon as his back was turned, obeyed unwillingly and looked desperately about for something that he could seize as a weapon. One of the metal braziers, full of smoldering coals, was at his very feet. He stooped quickly, lifted it in his hands, and turned upon the necromancers. Vembatsith, as he had suspected, was prowling toward him with upraised sword, and was making ready to strike. Farium hurled the brazier and its glowing contents full in the necromancer's face, and Vemba Tsith went down with a terrible smothered cry. Nargai, snarling ferociously, leapt forward to assail the defenseless youth. His scimitar gleamed with a wicked luster in the lurid glare of the urns as he swung it back for the blow. But the weapon did not fall, and Farium, steeling himself against the impending death, became aware that Nargai was staring beyond him, as if petrified by the vision of some Gorgonian specter. As if compelled by another will than his own, the youth turned and saw the thing that had arrested Nargai's blow. Arctella and Abnon Tha, pausing before the open door, were outlined against a colossal shadow that was not wrought by anything in the room. It filled the portals from side to side, it towered above the lintel, and then, swiftly, it became more than a shadow. It was a bulk of darkness, black and opaque, that somehow blinded the eyes with a strange dazzlement. It seemed to suck the flame from the red urns and fill the chamber with a chill of utter death and voidness. Its form was that of a worm-shapen column. Huge as a dragon, its further coils still issuing from the gloom of the corridor, but it changed from moment to moment, swirling and spinning as if alive with the vortical energies of dark eons. Briefly, it took the semblance of some demoniac giant with eyeless head and a limbless body, and then, leaping and spreading with smoky fire, it swept forward into the chamber. Abnon Tha fell back before it with frantic mumblings of malediction or exorcism, but Arctella, pale and slight and motionless, remained full in its path while the thing enfolded her and enveloped her with a hungry flaring until she was hidden wholly from view. Farium, supporting Elaith, who leaned weakly on his shoulder as if about to swoon, was powerless to move. He forgot about the murderous Nargai, and it seemed that he and Alaith were but faint shadows in the presence of embodied death and dissolution. 
He saw the blackness grow and wax with the towering of fed flame as it closed about Arctella, and he saw it gleam with eddying hues of somber iris like the spectrum of a sable sun. For an instant, he heard a soft and flame-like murmuring. Then, quickly and terribly, the thing ebbed from the room. Arctella was gone as if she had dissolved like a phantom on the air. Born on a sudden gust of strangely mingled heat and cold, there came an acrid odor, such as would rise from a burnt-out funeral pyre. Mordigian! shrilled Nargai, in hysteric terror. It was the god Mordigian! He has taken Arctella! It seemed that his cry was answered by a score of sardonic echoes, unhuman as the howling of hyenas, and yet articulate that repeated the name Mordigian. Into the room, from the dark hall, there poured a horde of creatures whose violet robes alone identified them in Farium's eyes as the priests of the ghoul god. They had removed the skull-like masks, revealing heads and faces that were half anthropomorphic, half canine, and wholly diabolic. Also, they had taken off the fingerless gloves, there were at least a dozen of them. Their curving talons gleamed in the bloody light like the hooks of darkly tarnished metal. Their spiky teeth, longer than coffin nails, protruded from snarling lips. They closed like a ring of jackals on Abnon Tha and Nargai, driving them back into the farthest corner. Several others, entering tardily, fell with a bestial ferocity on Vembatsith, who had begun to revive and was moaning and writhing on the floor amid the scattered coals of the brazier. They seemed to ignore Ferium and Alaith, who stood looking on as if in some baleful trance. But the hindmost, ere he joined the assailants of Vembatsith, turned to the youthful pair and addressed them in a hoarse, hollow voice, like a tomb reverberate barking. Go, for Mardigian is a just god, who claims only the dead and has no concern with the living. And we, the priests of Mordigian, deal in our own fashion with those who would violate his law by removing the dead from the temple. Ferium, with a lathe still leaning on his shoulder, went out into the dark hall, hearing a hideous clamor in which the screams of men were mingled with the growling as of jackals, the laughter as of hyenas. The clamor ceased, as they entered the blue-lit sanctuary and passed toward the outer corridor, and the silence that filled Mordigian's fane behind them was deep as the silence of the dead on the black altar table.